Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to our issue briefing on criminal justice reform. For 38 years now, GOPAC has trained and helped elect and educate generations of Republican leaders. And one of the hallmarks of GOPAC is getting elected officials together at the state level to share best practices and trade ideas on the conservative ideas that they are championing in their state to directly impact and help improve the lives of their citizens. In the last couple years, we've seen Republican states look at criminal justice reform and look at ways that we can take a system that's spending $80 billion a year, has 2.2 million people incarcerated. And is there a better way? Is there a better way to help these individuals, a more compassionate way to help these individuals who want to get away from a life of crime and they want to get a job and they want to be productive members of society? How do we best do that? And we're fortunate today to have three governors here with us to talk about it. Just as we are fortunate as GOPAC has looked to shine a light on what conservatives are doing on an issue that we believe helps bring appeal from Republicans, Democrats, and independents. That in a time right now when our country is pretty divided, this is an issue that we believe helps bring people together. And as we thought about this and the research we did, the work the US Justice Action Network is doing on this issue was very impressive. The work that they're doing to help educate legislators across the state, the examples that they're showing legislators and, and with, with model legislation that they could do, it's very impressive. And every opportunity that I get out on the stump to talk about this issue, I like to focus people on what US Justice Action Network is doing and we're delighted to partner with U.S. Justice Action Network, and please welcome Holly Harris, the president of the U.S. Justice Action Network. Thank you, David, and thank you to GOPAC for all the great education that you've done on justice reform this year. We sure appreciate it. So the idea for today's event actually just started out as a hypothetical. We thought, what if we could get three governors to do a film and talk about justice reform with stories of offenders, and what if we could roll it out at the RNC? When we said it, nobody actually believed that we could do it, and yet here we are. Which has sort of been the story of this movement. In our first year, we've accomplished more to advance justice reform than we ever dreamed was possible. The vision for the U.S. Justice Action Network came from our flagship funders, the great philanthropists John and Laura Arnold of Texas, represented here today by Ashley Hanna, our board chairman. Do not be fooled, though she be but little, she is fierce. <laughs> um, Ashley, without your support and your direction, none of this would be possible. So thank you and thank you to the Arnolds. The Arnolds had this crazy idea to put together eight of the country's most high-profile voices, groups that rarely agree on anything, and challenge them to work together to fix our broken justice system. They felt that if these groups, like the NAACP and Freedom Works, like the ACLU and Americans for Tax Reform, if these groups could put aside their differences and work together to advance these reforms, then surely lawmakers across the country could do the same. And they were right. In our first year in existence, the Justice Action Network grew its target states from three to 12 and passed significant reform legislation in 11 of them. To date, the Justice Action Network has never lost a vote. At this time, I'd like to ask the members of our tireless team to please stand, starting with Jenna Mall. Jenna is our deputy director. She crisscrossed the country uh, with me to film the piece that you'll see today. Jenna is unmatched in her knowledge of justice reform issues and has literally worked in states from Hawaii to West Virginia. Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> Jenna, I thank God every day I have you. Um, I'd also ask for, ask for Steve Hawkins, um, who is the president of our sister organization, the Coalition for Public Safety, to please stand, along with our national partners here today, Freedom Works, right here, Faith and Freedom Coalition, Americans for Tax Reform, and our in-state partner, Ohio's premier policy experts, 
the Buckeye Institute. Gentlemen, up, everybody. <laughs> this world-class team has really made justice reform into a movement. I'd also like to recognize our Ohio advisor, Kevin Schmidt, who's been working on this project for months and literally got 200 emails from me a day. Uh, FYI, full disclosure, Kevin went to school at Duke, but we're here today to talk about second chances, right, Kentucky? <laughs> yeah, that's right. You knew I'd work that in somewhere. I uh, also want to say thanks to the Pinkston Group and Harbinger Outreach for building this event today. And finally, thanks to our advisor on the federal level, the most put upon lobbyist in all the land, Hunter Bates. Hunter, where are you? <laughs> Speaking of the federal legislation, we are honored today to have Congressman Doug Collins from Georgia with us. Congressman Collins, there we go. Congressman Collins, along with Speaker Ryan, Senators Lee, Grassley, and Cornyn, is an influential voice on the Hill for justice reform. He's also been chosen of one, as one of five Republicans to sit on the Community Policing Task Force that, as you can imagine, has some very challenging work ahead. Um, Congressman Collins, thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you to you and your wife for attending today. We sure appreciate it. Friends, we live in perilous times, and criminal justice reform isn't going to solve all of our problems. But this country badly needs a point of unity, an issue that brings together the right and the left and people of all communities. Through justice reform, we can bridge the great divide in this nation, rebuild trust, make our country safer, and offer hope to people who feel left behind. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to honor three leaders today who are leading the charge to fix our broken justice system. They are changing laws and changing lives. Chambers, we're in the Department of Corrections in LaGrange, Kentucky, currently in the Library of Unit 5. I was in active heroin addiction and I went to a detox facility in downtown Louisville and I stayed for 48 hours and the heroin withdrawal made me so sick that I walked out and I was staying with a friend's parents and I walked from their house into that first bank. That's where I sought my relief at. Police say he barged into a PNC bank on Preston Highway, handed a demand note to a teller, and made off in a getaway car. The cycle continued because I was not arrested or caught. I went right back to another bank. And I did that six times within 28 days, and I was arrested coming out of the last bank. So my grandfather was an alcoholic. My mother was an alcoholic. As a child, it did not look that way. I thought it was weird when I'd go to friends' houses, and then I, and later on, my friends weren't allowed to come to my house, and I didn't really understand why, because it was my normal. By the age of 16, I was a full-on alcoholic. The minute I got a vehicle, I got a DUI, and went to rehab, and I got arrested. So I came out of prison. I was released. I was discharged at midnight. I came home to my mother strung out on meth. My little sister was also strung out with my mother. And uh, it wasn't two weeks before my mother, myself, and my little sister were all shooting meth together. I was, was running the streets, sh strung out, and I found out that I was pregnant. That completely changed my life. Growing up in foster care, I had a lot of trauma. I was molested, I was physically abused, raped in pretty much every foster home that I was in. I was only 15 when I started selling drugs. I was put on probation and went back home for a while. I started using cocaine, started drinking. I wasn't making my decisions. One day I had all three of my kids at home. My baby, she was like 23 days old. But I took too much and fell asleep on the couch. And at the time my son was five, he called the police. He thought his mommy was dead. 
was arrested then for child endangerment and possession. I went to jail. It's sickening that I would put them through that. My biggest change came from admitting that I wasn't a good mother. I I didn't think that I deserved my children. America was founded, interestingly, by many people who came here for a second chance. It's, it's in our DNA, it's, it's in who we are as a society. I think we've always offered that. And I believe in redemption, I believe in opportunity. I don't think we're really helping society if we don't rethink what being incarcerated really is intended to do. It's not just to remove, but it is to rehabilitate. And I think that's an important distinction that we need to focus on. To incarcerate an adult is about eighteen to $19,000 per person per year. That is a significant price tag. So it just makes sense from the financial standpoint that if you can move these individuals into a less costly environment, Financially, it makes sense. But secondarily, the more important reason is if you can show success that will keep them from being a repeat offender. And perhaps third, it may be the most important of all. You change the dynamics of families. Because crime in many parts of the country, including Georgia, it is generational. Children have grown up in families where their parents are addicts where their parents are in and out of jail and in and out of prison. So many of them, that is an accepted way of life. But if you break that cycle to show them that there is a different way, then you not only save money in the short term, you save lives in the short term, and you cause generational changes. Individuals with a criminal background do face multiple barriers and multiple challenges that other individuals may not have that we serve. Finding a job when you have a criminal background is devastatingly difficult. Oftentimes when an employer sees that there has been criminal history in one's background, it either goes in the trash or it certainly goes in the bottom of the pile. And so you really have to get through to society. You have to get through to employers. The importance of putting returning citizens to work. A lot of great examples of programs throughout the state and certainly throughout the nation that I think we can replicate throughout the nation that once again help families stay together, help people become productive, employed citizens and to become valuable for their own value in, in life. Rehabilitation can't start while you are getting out of the prison. They have to start while they're inside the prison. And so we start bringing in mentors, we start bringing in the faith community, we start bringing in nonprofits, start bringing in state agencies to build relationships to answer those questions. Where am I going to live? Where am I going to work? Can we uni reunify you with your family? Can we work on ways of getting that community to rally around you, to support you when you come out of the prisons? Because if we don't do that, we'll always be spitting in the wind, driving down the freeway, and not really helping what we now call our returning citizens. We're going to see two returning citizens in the field, which is their, in their environment, their home. We're going to check them out and see what they're doing, see if they're being compliant, if they're following rules of probation, make sure that they're you know, doing the right things. Prisoner Reentry Initiative, it helped me become, I guess, like a, a grown woman, because I was a child when I first got incarcerated. It kind of is kind of helping me get structure and build more, you know, like woman power. These are people. They're people like us. They're people who, they, they too wake up in the morning and want to be better versions of themselves. What can we do to come alongside people like that? I tell some of my religious leaders, I said, if you ever run out of material for a sermon, go to a drug court graduation and listen to the graduates and their stories. Stories of people who have lost everything. To see them decide that they want to be different and change it and see society through an uh, opportunity of, of an accountability court or a drug court, give them a chance to change that dynamic and they do it successfully. It's the story of redemption. 
pain that contact with families is huge. I watch the guys struggle in here, the ones that can't reach their families, the ones where the phone calls are too expensive and they can only call home once a week or something. I watch that and I watch what it does to their soul. And uh, the more access to support that they can have in here, the better. I would encourage every elected official, go into our prisons, have a frank and honest and current conversation with people who are incarcerated in your communities, in your states. They must become a part of the fabric of America because the beauty and the greatness of the tapestry that is America is comprised of many different threads. They're different colors, they're different thicknesses, but together they make the mosaic that is the beauty of America and we need it to be strong. Ladies and gentlemen, your governors, Matt Bevan, Nathan Deal, Mary Fallon, and Ohio Senate President Keith Faber. Outstanding. Outstanding. Nicely done. Nicely done. Wow, nicely done, nicely done. It is, a, uh, it is a powerful day here to be in Ohio. I want to welcome everybody to Ohio. This is a beautiful facility. But you know, as we sit here and, and we look at what we've been doing, uh, it, it really reminds me of how important it is that the states as laboratories of democracy get on top of this topic. And I looked at the movie and, and I talked about the things we've been doing here in Ohio for a while. But, uh, but governors, um, I guess I'm just going to open it up. This, this film was a powerful testament to your commitment on justice reform. Uh, you decide, uh, when you decided to participate in this, this project, what went through your minds? Why did you guys decide to move forward on trying to do criminal justice reform? Governor, we'll start down in Georgia. Georgia! Thank you. <laughs> well, in my first state of the state address, in 2011 when I was just becoming the new governor of Georgia. It was an issue that I decided we should take on. It was something that our state at that point in time was the 10th largest population state, but we had the fourth largest prison population in the country. We knew that it was not working. Our budget for our prison system had gone over $1 billion a year, had doubled in the last two decades, as had our prison population. I was told that the 56,000 Georgians who were in our prisons, that I better get ready to build two new adult prisons within my first term for about $264 million cost tag. I decided we could do better. We had accountability courts, but not very many in our state. We knew they were working. So I decided we needed to take it on. One of the first questions I got was, you're a Republican governor, aren't you? This is not sound like a Republican issue. Well, one of my floor leaders was now Congressman Doug Collins, and I am so pleased he is now representing the congressional district that I used to represent. We took it head on. But we knew that in order to break the psychology that had pervaded in our country about tough on crime, nobody can dare be soft on crime, that we needed to do it by putting together a criminal justice reform task force. We did that. We appointed members from the criminal justice community. They came together and made recommendations, and we presented it that first year in 2012. And from there, uh, we have had a series of reforms from that year until the conclusion of the 2016 session of the General Assembly, and we expect to have more in the upcoming sessions. Great, great start. Governor Fallon in Oklahoma, 
this can't be, you know, you always have this discussion, I'm sure, with your constituents and, and your legislators. Legislators, uh, one of my colleagues who, who's in Congress now always says, legislators rarely see the light, they often feel the heat. So the, the question is, how did, you, how did you convince your legislators to go along? And one of my Save the State speeches a couple of years ago, I talked about things that hold Oklahoma back. And there are three things I listed that hold us back. One was the need to improve education in our state. The second one was health care and our health outcomes. And the third was over-incarceration of our citizens. And those three things hold us back from reaching our potential as a state for creating more jobs and opportunities, for having healthy, stronger families, for just being a, a better state in, in general. And so I too, like Governor Dill, worked very hard to establish a task force, bring in all the stakeholders in law enforcement and criminal justice and mental health and health, families, and the judges, the district attorneys, to meet together to look at ways that we could do many things. First of all, to divert people from going into prison. Secondly, to be smart on crime, but also tough on crime. In other words, keeping the people we're scared of locked up. Mm -hmm. And third, looking at how we could build community partnerships, find the most successful programs that work, and then fourth, certainly, authoring legislation that would change the, the trajectory, basically, of where we we're going as a state. We, too, have had a, a high rate of incarceration in Oklahoma. In fact, one of the things I don't like being number one is, is number one incarcerating women in the nation in Oklahoma. And I always tell people as a joke, you know, women in Oklahoma aren't that mean. <laughs> But the fact of the matter is that women have challenges, and so do men, certainly so do everyone, but whether it's substance abuse, whether it's lack of education, whether it's poverty, whether it's other addiction issues, there are many, many different reasons you go into crime. And so I set about trying to identify what those reasons are, finding successful programs that we could implement in our state so that we could help people be successful and achieve their full potential in their life and make Oklahoma better. Great, great. Governor, uh, in your state, which is just down the road a piece from where I live, I know people are real concerned about making sure that their communities are safe. And yet you, uh, as a new governor, made sure you undertook this, this task. Uh, what kind of reaction and, and what were your thoughts when you did that? It's interesting. First of all, I'll say that I'm married to a woman from Oklahoma, so I will vouch for the fact that they're not all mean. I had to get that out there on the record there. But, the, uh, but in all seriousness, I mean, it's, I, I think it's important to understand that the two are not uh, independent of one another. Uh, criminal justice reform and the safety of communities, I believe, go hand in hand. I think we will be safer if we concentrate our law enforcement and uh, criminal justice resources uh, and energies on those individuals who truly need for the safety of society and frankly for themselves in large measure to be incarcerated. We need to be tough on crime. I ran on this issue, however, because as a state, we were number seven, there were only six political entities in the world, countries, states, provinces, anywhere in the world who have a greater percentage of their citizens incarcerated. Clearly, uh, we can do better than that. And, I, and what I, you know, as, a, as somebody whose Christian faith defines my worldview on things, you know, people in our prison systems come from a variety of faith beliefs or non-beliefs. But one of the things I'm struck by is when Christ taught people to really look after three constituencies. The ones that everybody remembers, for good reason, are the widows and orphans. But throughout scriptures, there is tremendous amount of, of attention that is drawn to those that are in prison. And when you spend time in our prison system and you meet the men and women who have, for any number of reasons, found themselves on the wrong side of the law, and who are getting the punishment that they deserve, and that society owes those in society to meet out on people. Nonetheless, we need to give people the opportunity for rehabilitation, because if you rob an individual of dignity, which ultimately some of our criminal justice system has become about breaking people down, mm -hmm. and if you rob a person of dignity, you take away their humanity. A person who's been robbed of their humanity makes inhumane decisions. We saw it reflected in this video. And people who make inhumane decisions are of no value to themselves, their families, their communities, and society as a whole. And we, I believe, owe better than that to each of them and to ourselves as a result. Very good.
Thank you. So, so Governor, in Georgia, what are the greatest challenges you're, you're, you're seeing your, your state face in your criminal justice system? And then what are you doing specifically to address some of those? You talked a little bit about facility construction. I'm just impressed at how inexpensive apparently it is to build prisons in Georgia. <laughs> We're told it's about a billion dollars a facility. So you guys, you guys have a, a better, more efficient system than we do in Ohio. It's union labor. Well, uh, they're always. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. The mic's on. <laughs> I do. There are always challenges that you have to face. Um, we just simply talked about the facts that were indisputable facts. A higher percentage of our people in our prison system were being classified by us as nonviolent. You tell the average citizen that you're going to pay eighteen to nineteen thousand dollars a year to incarcerate a nonviolent non individual in a prison. They look at you like, well, what's wrong with you? So what we have seen as a result of our reforms, our accountability courts was our first step. That is diversionary courts on the front end to deal with those nonviolent offenders, to give them a second chance. Drug courts, DUI courts, mental health courts, increasingly veterans courts. They've been hugely successful. We have seen them spread all across our state. The second year we took on juvenile justice reform, equally difficult and even more expensive at the right. tune of about $91,000 a year per juvenile for a year of incarceration because you have to do so many more things. Right. We followed the same approach. We've seen tremendous improvements in the statistics. In some of our jurisdictions in juveniles, we've seen a 65% drop uh, in felony accusations being brought into the courts uh, for juveniles if they have had the opportunity for diversion programs. But the one I want to concentrate on because, before we run out of time is, I think it's important that you have to deal with the continuum of criminal justice. Uh, it's okay to divert, and you should divert nonviolence on the front end. It's okay, and you should divert juveniles on the front end. But what about those thousands who are already in your system serving, in many cases, long terms? We know that almost all of them at some point in time are going to be paroled, and they're going to be back in society. We knew that we had a 30% or more recidivism rate for adults, a 65% recidivism rate for juveniles. And so I asked for a survey of our population and our prisoners. What is the most common characteristic? The most common characteristic was they dropped out of school. They don't have a high school diploma, they don't have a GED, and they don't have a marketable skill. So if they serve 15 to 20 years in our prison system and leave still having no education, still having no marketable skills, is it any wonder that they come back? So we started an intensive program of training within our prison system. We have seen a 33% increase in education taking place in our prison since 2012. We are having the cooperation of the business community on the outside. In fact, we are a state that's growing with manufacturing. We have manufacturers who say we need welders. If you'll train people in prison to be welders when they are paroled, we will guarantee them a job. So you have to deal with the continuum of it. But in case I don't have a chance to say so, I want to say this. I tell my state, and we're in the midst of my last two years, we're going to focus on education reform. To me, education reform is the ultimate criminal justice reform. If we really want to do preventive action, then we ought to make sure that we don't have those young people who are not finishing high school and therefore have no skills. Right. It's interesting. In Ohio, one of the things we look at is the number of our population that has an addiction. Uh, alcohol are usually drugs. And we always say the best way to keep people off drugs is to get them never to start. And the best way to get them never to start is to get them involved in something that's going to keep them out of that environment. So that's what you're talking about education as well. That's right. Governor, uh, Oklahoma, what challenges do you see for your criminal justice system? And, and uh, frankly, I, I, I always tell people when we're dealing with legislative leaders and, and political leaders from state to state, that's the great things about the states being laboratories of democracy. I feel free to plagiarize all the great ideas you're doing to make our state better, and we'll give you all ours so you can make your state better. And that's the idea of how we can work together as elected leaders at the state level. And so from, from your perspective, what, what kind of things are you seeing as challenges in Oklahoma? I think one of our biggest challenges that was mentioned a few moments ago was changing the attitude that it's okay to talk about criminal justice reform and that it's not a Democrat or Republican issue, it's an American issue. It's one that affects every American family. Thank you, Thank you all.
it isn't sexy. It isn't sexy to talk about letting people out with shorter terms or to get people who have been convicted into an employment when people say, well, I've never been convicted and I don't have a job either. So you you're know, right. Senator, one of the things I always ask when I speak on this topic in front of an audience is, is there anyone in this room that does not have a relative, a friend, or know someone in your community that's been in trouble and incarcerated? Or has an addiction problem? Yeah. Or any type of issue with the law enforcement? See, there's no one in this room that has never met someone like that. And so it goes back to how can we make our state stronger? How can we help our families stay together? And I, I look at it not only from, from the way uh, the governor just talked about, from uh, education certainly is very important, uh, the jobs that are lost in our community because someone's locked up in prison, they're not available for the workforce. But I also look at it from the point of view of all the other things that go along with high rates of incarceration. Like in Oklahoma, we have had typically around 11,000 children in state custody. And if you look at, for, for example, the women that are incarcerated in Oklahoma, you'll find that about 85% of them have children. And when the mother is out of the home, the children do not have that nurturing from her. And, and a lot of times that mother may be a single mother. As, as you saw in the video, the young lady that was shown talking about her addiction and her parents and how it was generational, that lady is from Oklahoma. And I sat down at the table and, and visited with her. But one of the things that you find is that children have a high propensity to end up incarcerated themselves if their parents are, mm -hmm. as we saw that lady talk about, and her children, thank goodness she's broken that cycle, hopefully, and her children hopefully won't end up like that. But the, the cost on society, the cost on life, whether it's poverty, whether it's lack of an educated workforce, whether it is the cost of the state budget, as I mentioned, we're number one on incarcerating women. We're one of the top five states in incarcerating men fathers who are out of the household, fathers who are out of, out of uh, work and, and not supporting their families. And certainly uh, just, just the overall prosperity of the state. And we look at poverty rates, we look at per capita income rates, those things all get reduced when you have people who are locked up. Now, we too, we're, we're a tough on crime state. And one of the things I found when I became governor is that as I would look through the, the pardons and the paroles, and signing off on those things, and I did them myself, and I would read the background of the people and their history and how they get to this situation. You know, I found a lot of, uh, of unequal treatment many times in our sentencing. I would find someone that maybe had some type of conviction for a substance abuse issue, but yet they were given 10 years. I thought, why, why was that? And I'd find somebody else that would be given a year, and they would serve majority of the time, and then they'd get out quicker. And so I saw a lot of unequal sentencing. And so we set about working on sentencing reform and working with our DAs and working with our judges and working with our law enforcement to look at misdemeanors versus felonies and, and what level of, of amount of money should we make it a felony for property crime. We increase that and work with our DAs to get them to look at giving more misdemeanors versus felonies because we believe that if you take someone who has, say, an addiction problem that's a low-risk, low-offender person and you put them in with a hardened criminal, they're going to come out worse. And there may come a day when they do get out, as you said, Governor. In fact, a large percentage of them will. Yeah, we call that criminal boot camp. Uh, when you take people who aren't so bad and put them in with people who are pretty bad, more often than not, you're, you're sending them to criminal boot camp, and they'll come out with, with new skills that may not work at society's advantage. And so, Governor, uh, from, from your state's perspective, what are your challenges? What are the challenges you're seeing in your criminal justice system? We don't have enough time for me to go through all of them, but I will say this. I mean, I'm grateful for two things. I'm grateful, frankly, for the fact that those that sit with me on the stage, I can, as was noted, learn so much from. I'm the newest governor up here with respect to tenure, and the, and the challenges that we face are no different than you all have faced. Uh, you're years ahead of us on this front in some regard. And, and I am a big believer, and I shared this with both of you, in taking the best ideas that I find uh, from other people and replicating them to the best of our ability. We have tremendous issues, though, even now. We have a tremendously high percentage of folks incarcerated. We have tremendous drug addiction problems. We have a heroin epidemic that's not unique to our state, but that we are gripped by as much, sadly, proportionally, as any state in the, in the country. 
Uh, these are things that we uh, have yet to, to face. Two things we've done. I was able to sign into law an expungement bill, which I'll tell you truly, it gives me, it was, a tr it, was a, it was an effort of many. This is a bill that had come forward and failed year after year, session after session. But just as it takes from the stage, as it takes from each of you in this audience, for you've come here for different reasons, you care about this for different reasons, but it takes leadership, it really does. I'm grateful for the fact that we had people in our House and Senate, people who transcended partisanship. Our Senate President, Robert Stivers, who's actually here, and I say this not simply because he's here, <laughs> truly, as a, Republican, as a Republican leader in a house where the house is, in a state where the House is controlled by Democrats, where there's this seeming partisan divide, they worked together, and it was the leadership of people like Robert Stivers and others who have championed this and taken this forward. I made clear when I was running this was something we were going to sign into law, and for nonviolent offenders, we now have, for a, a, a significant number of classes of offenses, we've been able to uh, remove these and now expunge them. That went into effect July 15th, and one of the very first people to have his record expunged was a, a young man who is not really a young man anymore. He's a middle-aged man, uh, a father, uh, a man who has his own business, uh, who has been hampered by his felony conviction. Uh, he was one of the very first to have it expunged. He was one of the catalysts for ensuring this ultimately was passed. So that, together with the final thing we're doing right now, although it's not final because it's the front end, we have put together a panel of 23 people. It's a council comprised of law enforcement officers, prosecutors, people from the faith community, former convicted folks, people who have a vested interest in this from a variety of standpoints. And they are legislators, people are politically elected, and people not. People from the business community, employers. These 23 individuals are meeting over the next six months to put together ideas that we will put into legislation, that we will codify, that we will move forward. And you mark my words. I mean, I say this. Kentucky uh, will we'll, we'll do everything we can to replicate that which is done. But you will see a transformation because it needs to happen. We have tremendous upside opportunity as it relates to criminal justice. Great, great. You, you all kind of touched on this issue, but criminal justice reform is a bipartisan issue. Uh, the Justice Action uh, Network is as bipartisan or nonpartisan in some contexts. I always call it an, an interesting alliance uh, when you've got the groups that are behind it. Um, I, I always said if one of those groups that's, that's on that list ever advocates for something, I'm sure I'd always vote against it. But when they work with Grover Norquist, I'm going, okay, this sounds like it may have some merit. You're all representing states that are, are fairly conservative. Um, how does this politically sell? And, and, and the actions you've done, when we talk to our other friends in other states, how, how do we convince conservatives? This is a Republican uh, convention that we're at. How do we convince conservatives that it's not about being hard on crime or soft on crime, it's about being smart on crime? Um, one of the things one of my colleagues brought up, and I always try and use this, and we were doing one of our bills, was, look, we want to make room so we have room to keep all the really bad people so we can keep them away from our families. And, and the people not so bad, you know, the people, most Ohio prisoners, by the way, are there for a very short period of time, less than 24 months. Um, and so we want to make sure we have room for the bad guys. And the way to do that is make sure we're not spending a lot of extra money on the not so bad guys that we can treat and, and spend money in other ways. So how do we convince our colleagues, both in our own states and then around the country, that this isn't the third rail of Republican politics? Well, uh, I tried from the beginning with this bipartisan group of law enforcement to, to have the input and make recommendations. It worked. In fact, it's worked so well, we have continued it on, and it will continue as long as I'm governor to have this reform commission, because there's work to do. It's an ongoing process. The first year we presented it, it passed the House and the Senate unanimously. Most things that have any controversy associated with them don't do that. The second year, juvenile justice reform passed both bodies unanimously. The third year, which was the reforms within our prison system. I think in the House we had three dissenting votes. They were all Republicans, and two of those Republicans were beat in the Republican primary that was coming up that year. Um, it has been a bipartisan issue. And as far as the political benefits that may uh, accrue from all of this, because it is a bipartisan issue, it, I believe, from a Republican point of view, shows that Republicans are not what many people would paint us to be. 
the lock them up, throw away the key. Because we all have to remember that the whole purpose of government, one of the main purposes, is to keep our people safe. We know that the old methods were not doing that. And when you convince people that the reforms will keep you more safe than you are now, which that is absolutely true, then most people come on board. And we've been very, very fortunate in Georgia to have bipartisan support. That's great. That's great. Governor? Well, I agree with everything the governor just said. There were several things that went into our work on criminal justice reform, and we've been doing it for many years now, and we, we will still continue to do that as I finish up my last two years. But a couple of things. One of our biggest issues in Oklahoma, and I think this is in every state, is addiction problems. Whether it's prescription drug abuse, whether it's alcoholism, maybe it's heroin, whatever it might be, that affects and touches probably about every family in one way shape or form, whether it's a direct family member, someone down the line, or maybe just someone they know in the community. And so a couple of years ago, we started talking about addiction issues and substance abuse in our state and about how many people we have locked up in our prison systems who have an addiction issue that aren't necessarily someone that you're scared of, but someone just has a problem and they need help with it. And you're just mad at them and you wish they'd get their act together. And so we started talking about that. And about two years ago, I think it was, we passed a bill called the Prescription Monitoring Act in which we started talking to our doctors and the people in the health profession about the writing of prescription drugs and how easy it was to become addicted to those drugs and how many lives were lost, how many people were breaking up their families or losing their employment or ending up in our prison systems costing the state money, is the same, same numbers uh, Governor talked about, it's about 19000 a year to lock someone up, versus sending someone through a drug court, which is about $5,000 a year, and getting someone treatment and someone help, and helping them find employment, and getting them their GED, or getting them their education, or substance abuse treatment, or, or getting them into some type of community service program to where they can be on a, a work release community sentencing. So we started talking about all those things and how it would make a difference. Uh, because we've gone through a little bit of a, an oil energy downturn in, in our state, we faced some budget crises the last couple of years. And so then the budget became a big issue, and it's always an issue. And of course, having a, a state where you incarcerate a lot of people costs a lot of money. And so it was affecting our budget. And then people were saying, well, we want you to put more money towards education. We want you to put more money towards health care or mental health services. Or roads and bridges. And I said, well, I, I got to spend this money on incarcerating people that are out of our workforce. And so, thank you. So as we began talking about those things, people began to see the financial cost, where there's a cost to the state budget, where there's lack of funding to other services, where there's a cost on the family, cost on the workforce itself, and whether we were doing things that, that made sense or not made sense. And I want to go back to something uh, the governor talked about, uh, two other things that we did in our state. You know, employment is one of the biggest challenges that someone coming out of being incarcerated faces. And so I signed an executive order called Ban the Box. And so on state applications, there's a box that says, have you been convicted of a felony? I took it off the state employment applications for state employees because as the video said, that if someone is applying for a job and you've got that box checked and employers looking at it, they may just throw that directly into the trash and not give that person the opportunity to talk about, well, when I was young, I made this dumb mistake, or whatever it might be. So we did that. The second thing we did was to pass a law that allowed under certain low-risk crimes that people would be able to get their licenses back to be able to work in certain classifications. That also helps people coming out of the prison systems to be able to find employment in our state, once again, putting the family back together, making productive citizens that will be taxpayers, that will have that dignity and that self-worth, give them the hope that you talked about. Sounds like you're, you're focusing one of the things we're trying to do as well, take people from being tax takers to taxpayers. Absolutely. Uh, it adds the dignity you talk so much about, Governor. Um, I really liked your perspective on that. In, in your state, uh, how, how do you convince, I mean, you're in a bipartisan or, or situation, a little more, 
uh, particularly in an area that, uh, you know, that look. We I'm envious of those who have united uh, legislatures behind them. I, I don't. The, uh, I mean, here's what it boils down to. This is not a partisan issue. This is a human issue. This is an issue. Dignity transcends party. Self-respect and respect for others and the rule of law transcends party. The irony is this House Bill 40, this expungement bill that I just referenced a moment ago, that had failed time and again, often obstacles were in my party. Uh, and, and or sometimes the other side because it didn't go far enough and ultimately again with the right kind of leadership it came together. This was something that had been the, the, the beloved bill of a particular legislator with whom I agree on very little. In fact, he's, he's suing me right now, uh, <laughs> as, as is almost every other Democrat in the state of Kentucky for something or another. Uh, and he's one of them. He's a legislator who is suing me over something that is me doing my job. And yet I was happy to stand there with him uh, and sign this bill into law because it was the right thing to do. And, uh, and I'll be honest, as I look at you all, how many of you, let me ask a quick question, how many of you have been into a prison? Not just on a tour of the front office, but been inside a prison. So a fair number of you. But a number of you have not. And I would challenge each of you to do so because with all due respect to every one of you, minus the ties in the, in the different colors in your clothes, uh, and the fact that you're currently men and women together in a room, is I look at you, I've been into a number of prisons, and frankly, the people in there look just like you. They look exactly like you. They probably proportionally have a few more tattoos than you do, but that might, <laughs> that might be the only real difference. And the reality is they come from, they are part of American society. And so what I would encourage you to do is please make sure you really get to know who these individuals are. It will shape you regardless. I mean, we're, we probably are mostly Republicans in this room. There's media people here, so, you know, I know some Democrats have snuck in. But that, <laughs> but that said, in general, we're Republicans. So the fact is we're somewhat of like mind. But here's the reality. Our state motto right here on this flag closest to me, united we stand, divided we fall. United we stand, divided we fall. If ever there is an issue that embodies that or that that represents as much as any other, it is this issue. I'm a business guy. The last thing I'll say is this. I've always been motivated. I'd never been elected to office prior to being governor. The thing that has driven my life, my adult life since I left the military was focus on return on investment. What is the ROI? And frankly, as has been noted by these governors here, what we want for the taxpayer's investment is a good return on the investment that has put into justice, rehabilitation, and reassimilation. Where is our return on investment? That's my focus. This is why it's easy for me, in some measure, to transcend the partisanship and work with whoever to get the job done, because united we stand and divided we fall. Great, great message. We're going to open it up to some questions. I think we had, uh, where's our question at? There we go. And uh, Hey, uh, Greg Williams, America's Web Radio and uh, home uh, in, in Georgia with uh, Governor Deal. Appreciate you guys' work on this. Uh, I have a question about rising probation rates. Uh, do you think that we need to get away from privatizing some of these probation companies? I know in Georgia, that's one of the problems that we're facing is we're actually having an increase in probation and wanted to see, we haven't really talked about that uh, and what y'all's opinions are on that level. Governor, it well, sounds like it was a Georgia question, but yes. we'll, well chime in. We, um, we have made major steps to reform the probation system. For one thing, we had a lawsuit in which uh, one of our superior court judges ruled that private probation was uh, unconstitutional. Uh, many local jurisdictions, and it is primarily smaller jurisdictions who are using private probation companies to collect the fines that are being imposed by municipal judges or state court judges. Um, we have made major changes in that regard. On probation as a whole, those that are in the more violent uh, or more uh, serious categories other than those kind of offenses where you simply have to pay a fine alone. Um, we have consolidated our supervisory uh, programs. It was not uncommon in a dysfunctional family in Georgia to see a, an officer representing the parole board because a member of the family had been paroled, they were being supervised on parole, 
Another member of the family had not been seriously enough uh, sentenced to be in our prisons, but they had been sentenced to probation by a superior court or state court judge, and they were being supervised by a probation officer. Uh, our juvenile justice probation officer may have one of the younger people in the household who is being supervised by a juvenile justice probation officer. And if you want to, on top of that, since it's such a dysfunctional family, you probably would see a car from our Department of Family and Children's Services who has responsibility for the younger children in the household. We have consolidated those into one agency, uh, Department of Community Services. It takes the old parole functions, the probation functions, and the juvenile justice functions and consolidates them. It is not only saving a lot of money, but it is cross-training these individuals so that they're better attuned to what is happening in this household that they go into. Uh, it, is, it is, I think, the wave of the future for looking at how do you supervise and how do you handle probation and other things that are not outside the wall. As a former probation officer, I can tell you that, uh, look, the crossover is a big deal. And, and you know, probation and parole ought to be about compliance. And, uh, and, and it needs to be focused. And to, to, you can be wraparound services, particularly with your job and family services folks, to get those people the services they need to get them compliant. It's going to make a better, better program. Right. Some other Governor, you have a comment on that? No, or? I was just going to say, I think some Next other. question. Russ Jones, USA Radio Networks and Liftable Media. A quick question. Why do you think there is a perception problem about uh, prison reform in the Republican Party? Because uh, I've served as a volunteer chaplain. And, majority of uh, people that work in the prisons and volunteer are evangelical Christians that typically affiliate with the Republican Party. So where's the disconnect? Let me just say this. If you, I would encourage you, please, to read the platform uh, for, this, for this party that was just voted on and passed the other day. Uh, please read that. And I think you will find uh, that while there may be a perception it's frankly a false narrative that has been perpetuated by, frankly, many people who would love for that to be true when, in fact, as you have personally experienced, it is not. And when you look for true leadership on prison justice reform, um, in, in prison reform and justice reform, when you look at the leadership, it has come out of the Republican ranks, not the least of which is represented. We're the tip of the spear. There are others of our colleagues who have done the same. So I think that that's a false narrative. It's being perpetuated by people who want that to be true when in fact it's not. Other questions? Hi, my name is Melissa Quinn. I'm actually a reporter with The Daily Signal. I have a question on an issue that we didn't talk about today but falls into overcriminalization. Governor Fallon, I'd like to get your thoughts on civil asset forfeiture reform, particularly given the climate and the debate in Oklahoma over this issue. We do have asset forfeiture laws in, a, in our state that if, if something is seized and there's a conviction on there, then it can be utilized back into the state. We've actually had a, a pretty strong debate on that this past couple of sessions, and we'll probably have another year of debate on that. Certainly, we want to make sure that the system is fair, that if property is seized, that it's seized justly because there's been a crime committed or a conviction that has been given. And that is a debate that we've been having in our state, and I think we'll continue to have that. But it's, it's an important issue, and, and certainly one that's a system that has been used throughout the criminal justice system for quite some time. Question. Wait, one quick comment on that real quick. I think it's important, and this is where I think our party will lead again. This is a critical issue because while indeed there should be a punishment for things, including criminal activity, that come at the cost of certain tangible assets, I do think it's important that we look closely at where those lines are drawn. I happen to own a piece of property. I rented it out to somebody to use for hunting purposes. It came to my attention they also were growing certain agricultural crops on my land. <laughs> And, uh, and again, and trust me, it's a fine line between just you, you, it's, you have to be careful about how you terminate a binding contract for them to use it for one purpose when in fact you find they're using it for something else. Had someone else discovered this, conceivably, it could have been turned into an instance where I may have lo lost my property. Do I have a problem with that? You bet I do. And so we need to be smart and we need to be thoughtful and we need to use a scalpel and not a sledgehammer as it relates to addressing this issue. Due process, a big component when you talk about forfeiture reform. Yes. Time for one more question, I'm told. 
Lawrence Smith from WDRB in Louisville, Kentucky. There appears to be a widening gulf between the public and police, particularly in the African-American community. What role can the states play in trying to bridge that, that gap? Great question. Well, I think first of all, you have to have confidence in your law enforcement, that they're giving equal justice to all, upholding the laws, abiding by the laws, and certainly we're having a huge national debate on this issue right now. People want to be treated fairly, but they also want to be protected, and law enforcement wants to be protected. Law enforcement needs to be protected also, because if they're not able to be able to do their job, they can't keep our communities safe, and if we don't have safety in our communities, we're going to have chaos, and that's what we've seen throughout various states and communities. That's very disconcerting. So um, I think the big thing is to make sure that people's rights are given, that they have their chance for due process, and that we also put back a, a spirit of just respecting our law enforcement. Exactly. Let me just say one quick thing on that. We have an obligation, frankly, as citizens to respect and protect those who respect and protect us. Are there exceptions within the ranks of any given constituency of people who do or don't follow the rule? Of course there are. But I'll tell you this, the idea, that there's an old saying, the fish rots from the head down. And that is the truth. And we have seen a degradation from the highest levels of authority politically in this nation, including through the Department of Justice, for the rule of law, for, we have. And people, people can quickly take a comment like that and try to twist it into some partisan attack. It is a statement of fact. We spend much more time celebrating what some celebrity has done through some insane action than we do in respecting the rule of law. And when there has been a loss within our law enforcement officers, is there, are all uniformed uh, people in this nation perfect? No, I used to be in the military, trust me. They are no different than any of us. There is no one in this room who is perfect in any way, shape, or form. For us to hold people to a degree, to a standard, and then to denigrate them, how would you like to be a uniformed officer in this nation, knowing that we have encouraged and fomented this? And truth be told, I challenge those of you in the media to cut it out, because really and truly, so much of this has been fomented by the ridiculous amount of coverage and the celebration. Like you touch the nerve. If, in fact, we do not support the men and women who protect and serve us every day, we will see a degradation of the rule of law and a, and a devolution of, of society the likes of which none of us would ever want to participate in. And I encourage us to take this seriously. We owe it to our law enforcement officers to have their back, period. We just do. Governor? We have done a lot of things to support our law enforcement officers with pay increases and others, but uh, we are in the process in my office of devising recommendations for our General Assembly for the next session that will go far beyond just that. As most of you know, and I think it's probably true in most states, the state law enforcement, for us at least, are Georgia State Patrolmen. They have responsibility for patrolling our highways. We then have a Georgia Bureau of Investigation, which is not in the day-to-day -day act active enforcement of the law. They become overseers, they become assistants when sheriffs call them in. Most of the day-to-day -day law enforcement for felonies relates to local sheriff's departments, local police departments. Now, there is a dialogue that needs to be taking place on this whole issue. We have moved in our society and in our state, and I think in most states, from the old practice of the officer on the beat, walking the streets in the community, to moving them into patrol cars who ride through the streets in the communities. Now, I admit, the streets are more dangerous now than perhaps they were when they were walking the beat. 
But that needs to be a dialogue that takes place. And I hope in our state it will take place. I'm going to try to make sure that it does take place. But we have to be sensitive to the fact that when you ask somebody to put on a uniform and to wear a bulletproof vest and to go into places that most of us would not want to go in no matter what, we owe it to them, to their families, especially to their wives and their spouses and their children to make sure that we do everything we can to protect them, to provide them with a kind of undergirding support so that they don't have to wonder. If I make a very difficult decision, and, and if you know, these are decisions that many times are made in a split second as to what to do. We have the luxury in the court systems to be the Monday morning quarterback who brings in experts to analyze this, analyze that, what would you do, et cetera, et cetera. They never ask the question, what would you do under those circumstances where you have to make what may be a life or death decision in a fraction or a couple of seconds? We have to appreciate that. We have to make sure that our citizenry appreciates that. We're going to have a detailed discussion in our state and with our members of our legislative bodies about what can we do to make sure that we do what, as I said earlier, one of the primary functions of government is to keep people safe. Thank you, governors. Uh, our time has expired. I, I want to... I want to just wrapping up, and, and I really appreciate the governor's insight. I, I made mental notes of th things that we're going to look at. But one of the things that I just want to commend them for is being leaders of courage. It is not an easy thing to do to get into your prisons and to talk to your inmates and to look at what you're going to do to make those lives matter and those lives better. And as we go through our legislative processes and we look at things, I think you said it, all three of you said it just wonderfully, uh, particularly on this last question, and it was a good question to end on with everything that's going on. I grew up in a law enforcement house. You always wanted to make sure dad came home. That's important. But one of the things Governor Kasich has done is he put together a panel, like, like you've all mentioned, on, on police and community relations. And that dialogue is also important because there are, are serious concerns in certain aspects of our communities that are legitimate. They are real concerns that we need to talk about, we can't hide from, but uh, those concerns don't obliterate the need to have that thin blue line. That line that, as you mentioned, if it devolves, we're in a position of having anarchy, and that won't work out well for anybody. So in the end, this process and this discussion needs to continue. We need to continue to do criminal justice reform. We need to continue to make sure we back our law enforcement agencies, and frankly, we need to convince our colleagues that it's not about being soft on crime, it's not about being hard on crime, it's about being smart on crime. And if you're not smart on crime, pretty soon, we're not going to have room or the resources in tough economic times to do what we need to do to keep our community safe. So thank you so much for the work you're leading us in. Thank you for the Justice uh, Action Network. Thank you for GOPAC for helping put this together. And thank you for all coming.